our next speaker is Karima Benon, who will make a tribute to those who've Who've, whom we've lost and who've fallen fighting the religious right. Karima is a social activist and the author of Your Fatwa Doesn't Apply Here. Untold stories from the fight against Muslim fundamentalism. In 2007, Benon became the first Arab American to win the Derek Bell Award for the, uh, Award for the Association of American, Laws, um, American Law Schools for Minority Groups. Currently, she sits on the board of the network of women living under Muslim laws. So please welcome Karima Benon. So what we remember this morning is that the struggle for secularism that Maria May alluded to has often taken the lives of those waging it. And we could go way back in history, we could go back to the 12th century execution of the Persian philosopher uh, Sohra Wardi in Aleppo. We could go back, of course, to the tens of thousands of victims of the Inquisition, but I'm going to focus on contemporary victims. And I hope you'll also bear with me, because I've only been given a few minutes to do this. I chose to be very focused about this, and uh, I'm not actually going to talk about... Um, oh, there, they did move to the in-memoriam slide. Just say next slide, and they'll fill it well. I, I've, I've got it, actually. Thanks. I think it'll work. Um, I've decided to be very focused and to talk about, in particular, about uh, the victims of uh, Islamism. Uh, there are many other victims that I could talk about, victims of the, the Christian right, uh, such as Dr. George Tiller, you see here, who was killed in the U.S. Perf for performing abortions, or uh, uh, Narendra Dabolkar, you see here, who was killed in India by the Hindu right in 2014, an atheist and anti-superstition campaigner. And of course, we remember all of them, but because I only have a few minutes, and because in the West at the moment there's a campaign afoot by people like Bill Maher to claim that most Muslims are fundamentalists, it seems a particularly important moment while remembering all the victims uh, to focus on those who have fallen in the struggle against Islamism this morning. Uh, and each of those that I am able to mention represent thousands of others, in some cases millions, in their country. Uh, they come from across the spectrum, ordinary people and intellectuals, religious believers, free thinkers and atheists, women and men. They come from the left, which has been especially targeted, but also from the center, from sometimes even from the center right and even among the apolitical. Uh, and I am sorry that I'm not able to mention other people, so I ask you to remember those and to share with us during uh, the weekend many others that we could mention here. Uh, let me just tell you about a few of uh, the amazing people that we should remember this morning. And I begin with Selwa Bugegis because we don't talk enough about Libya. Yesterday, I discussed Selwa with a Libyan women's rights advocate here in the UK named Sahar, who began weeping immediately just at the mention of her name because Selwa was such an amazing woman. She uh, went around bareheaded, as you see here in Benghazi. She was a human rights lawyer. She long campaigned against Gaddafi, and when I met her in 2011, was very optimistic about the future of her country. Um, she fled Libya because of threats to her life, but she was so determined that the Islamists be defeated in the elections that she went back to the country. And indeed, it's very important to remember, as Sahar pointed out when I met her yesterday, the Libyans did defeat the Islamists in multiple elections. But that defeat came at a terrible price because those who believe they have a religious mandate to rule uh, killed many and are waging terror now across the country. And one of those they killed, sadly, on June 25th of this year was Selwa Bugegis in her home in Benghazi. And I think in memory of her, the world must not forget her country and the fight of many other heroic Libyans just like her against extremism. Uh, Mohamed Brahmi, Tunisia. A left-leaning Arab nationalist, Tunisian legislator, and outspoken opponent of the Nahda, the then ruling fundamentalist party, was gunned down in front of his Tunis home in the hearing of his entire family, including his disabled daughter, on July 25, 2013. Brahmi's widow Mbarka, who is herself a devout Muslim, accused the Anahda party of complicity in her husband's murder and vocally denounced those she called merchants of religion. At the time of his murder, Brahmi was a member of the Tunisian Constituent Assembly, the body that was elected after the revolution to draft a new constitution. He was born like that revolution in Sidi Bouzid and from a poor rural background. His killing sent shockwaves across Tunisia, 
provoking popular protests by what became known as the Irhal or Get Out campaign that eventually led to a Nahda's ouster, though they threatened to return again now through the ballot box. Surrounded by her children in her living room, from which they heard Mohammed being shot outside, she recounted to me that he had said of the Islamist party in Nahda, they exploit Islam to have the sympathy of the people. The Muslim Brotherhood is the big stick of colonialism. That which colonialism was not able to achieve, it used the Muslim Brotherhood to complete. Katia Bengana, Algeria. Uh, Katia was dragged out of class and murdered by terrorists from the armed Islamic group on February 28, 1994, during what was called the Dark Decade in Algeria, because she refused to wear the hijab. She knew the risk that she risked death for this, but she chose to do so anyway to remain true to herself and to fight for freedom in this way. Her assassination sparked protests by women's groups inside Algeria at the time, despite the terrible danger. In a text that was later renamed, a letter from a father to his daughter who was assassinated for refusing to wear the veil, M. Bengana, Katya's father, wrote in 2010, it has already been 16 years since your assassination by religious fundamentalism for refusing to wear the veil. I accuse all those who instrumentalize religion to stay in power, sacrificing civilians and others. I accuse all those who use religion to turn us away from our roots, our customs, our traditions. Salah Shweki, Algeria. It is almost exactly 20 years ago now that Salah was gunned down on 14 September 1995 by the armed Islamic group on his way to work. He published many brilliant articles in the press, such as Compromise with Political Islam is Impossible, which you can find now in English translation on Open Democracy. His sister, Warida Shweki, said that the most important way to remember him is by combating the fundamentalist ideology which motivated his killing and by discrediting jihadist terrorism, the very things that we are doing this weekend. Shweki wrote that the most dangerous and deadly illusion is to underestimate fundamentalism, the mortal enemy of our people. His brave words and warnings, like so many other intellectuals uh, in Algeria he gave his life to articulate, remain relevant around the world today. He wrote what could sum up a main thrust of this conference if broadened to apply to all religions. He wrote, and you see the words there, the best way to defend Islam is to put it out of the reach of all political manipulation. The best way to defend the modern state is to put it out of the reach of all exploitation of religion for political ends. Monir Hashemi, Javad Gaidi, Sadeh Gaidi from Iran. This text comes from Maryam Namazi. Monir Hashemi, who you see here, was a communist activist under the Islamic regime. She was arrested by the regime in June 1982 with her husband, Javad, and his uh, brother, Sadeh. They were all uh, executed, and this is an example of how long people have been getting killed by the Islamists and how it has decimated entire families. Mercedes Gaidi, who spent eight years in Iranian prisons and is the sister of Javed and Sadeh, who you see here, is with us at the conference this weekend. Her mother is a leader in the Mothers of Caravan, which is similar to the Mothers of Argentina. And I would say personally that when I heard this story from Maryam, I thought first how horrific that entire families pay these awful prices. But then I also thought how inspiring it is that entire families resist. And so we remember Monir, Javad, and Sadeh, and we honor their family's ongoing struggle. Salman Tasir, Pakistan. Tasir was the governor of Punjab and outspokenly defended a Christian Pakistani woman named Asya Bibi who was sentenced to death for blasphemy. He was subsequently shot 26 times with a submachine gun four days after tweeting, I was under huge pressure, sure, to cow down before rightest pressure on blasphemy, refused, even if I'm the last man standing. Some Pakistani lawyers would actually take to the streets to show support for Tasir's killer, Malik Qadri. Qadri said that the governor was a blasphemer and that this was the punishment for that crime. Zili Huma Usman, the 36-year-old Punjab minister for social welfare and an advocate of women's rights, was shot in the head while speaking to women activists. 
it is believed that she was shot because of the way she was dressed. Uh, the man who killed her in particular said that that was part of the reason she died on the operating table at Lahore General Hospital. Uh, there, yeah, you can stay there. Sado Ali Warsame, Somalia. On July 23, 2014, the Islamist group Al-Shabaab claimed responsibility for the shooting death of Sado Ali Warsame, a musician and member of the Somali parliament. She was most famous for a protest song, and you can see the video on YouTube. Uh, and this song dates from the time of President Siad Barre. It's called Land Cruiser, which decried the fancy vehicles owned by the country's leaders when ordinary people were starving. She spent most of the Civil War in the United States, but returned to her country determined to help rebuild it in 2013, and one was, the, was one of the few women in Somalia's parliament. The BBC explained that she was particularly known for going on stage bareheaded and for wearing trousers. Tragically, she will never perform again. Al-Shabaab said openly that they killed her for her politics, but her voice lives on in the grainy YouTube video for Land Cruiser, singing with flowers in her hair and concern on her face, her image intercut with Land Rovers driving past kids standing in sewage on Somali streets. Her notes will echo forever in our ears. Liberal Muslim clergy in Chechnya and across the Caucasus. The Chechen journalist Said Bitsoyev told me in 2010 that the worst thing happening in his region was that those he called radicals were hunting, he said, for those Muslims who were representatives of tolerant Islam, and they were killing these people systematically. So now, he told me, we do not have many progressive Muslim leaders left. He gave me the example of Umar Idrisov, an 80-year-old mufti from Uros Martin, southwest of Grozny, who was assassinated in June 2000 by a Wahhabi group called Wolves of Islam. And I mention them because I don't know how much we're going to talk about the caucuses this weekend. It is so important to think of what is happening there. Idrisov was cut down by the Chechen fundamentalists because, in Said's words, radical people wanted to replace him and put radical leaders in his place. Two days after I interviewed Said Bitsoyev, another mufti, this time Anas Chikayev of Kabardino Balkaria, a Russian republic west of Chechnya, was murdered. This mufti was a deeply principled man who stood up both to the fundamentalists and the Russian authorities. Wahhabism, he had written, can bring great harm. Before his death, he received open threats, including some made right to his face. We've decided to kill you, they said. What do you think? He told the authorities that all the muftis in the Northern Caucasus needed protection, a point that was made two days later by his own assassination. Saudi Arabia. And uh, you see here, unfortunately, I, I desperately tried to find some photographs of the girls who were killed. But this is from a horrible incident in 2002 when the Mutawin, or the religious police, blocked girls who were trying to flee their burning school building because they were not properly covered. Uh, and the numbers of those who died are, uh, you find different statistics, but at least 15 girls were believed to have died. And you see the words of one of the fathers here behind me. Uh, and I'm sorry that picture didn't come out very well. Uh, but this is uh, people who died in the marketplace in Jos, central Nigeria, because I think we also have to remember the mass casualties, not just people who were targeted individually. 124 people were killed by a Boko Haram double car bombing uh, in May of this year. And uh, the CNN reporter said that when she tried to speak with a nurse by, at a local hospital by telephone, she was unable to hear because there were so many victims crying and screaming. Uh, and I think it's so essential that even though we will never know these people's names or see their faces, that we will not fail to hear their cries. Uh, and I do not have a picture of Hanif Asafi, the next person I want to talk to. So I put up two girls going to school, which is the thing she was fighting for. Uh, and this report comes from the Afghanistan Rights Monitor. Hanif Asafi, director of women's affairs in Lahman province, lost her life after a bomb was placed under her car on July 13, 2012. She was born in 1961 and was considered a woman of great courage and leadership. She spent most of her life teaching girls at schools in the north of Afghanistan. She was a passionate civil society and democracy activist. Uh, she ran for elected office a number of times and prior to her death received repeated threats from the Taliban but refused to quit her job. 
Uh, she was then killed by a car bombing in which her husband was severely wounded. And throughout her life, Hanifa was known for using her skills to help women who faced violence, deprivation, and all sorts of ill treatment. She said to the Christian Science Monitor shortly before her death, when the foreigners go, they are putting us in the mouth of a lion. Uh, and I think she knew exactly what she was saying because at the time that Hanifa was killed by the Taliban, the United States was avidly negotiating with that same group. And I have to jump forward because my time is up, although we could spend the whole weekend just on uh, tributes. If you go back to the candles, please. Okay. The last image with the candles. Anyway, while that's, I will go on. So finally we come to Iraq. And we come to the case of Samira Saleh al-Naimi, uh, who was killed in her hometown of Mosul on the 22nd of September, uh, so just recently. She was a human rights lawyer who had just denounced ISIS as a barbaric group. She had denounced them specifically for the destruction of historic sites in her hometown of Mosul. Uh, and the amazing thing uh, about this, of course, is that we don't see her face, we don't hear her name, we don't hear her story in the media coverage. So it seemed to me, in light of what's happening in Iraq, so important to end by remembering those thousands of victims in Iraq and Syria at the moment, uh, victims of many different groups, but in particular at the moment, victims of ISIS, and we think of those who are under siege in Kobani today. And I hope that as sad as these stories are, instead of just feeling sort of defeated and, and uh, in grief about them, we will draw inspiration from them. We will draw inspiration from the way that these people continued fighting against fundamentalism, fighting for secularism, for humanism, for tolerance. Uh, and I think it's so important that we really use their stories to inspire ourselves to continue their work. And here I think of a line from a wonderful story that was written by some Algerian students in the 90s. And they said, a dream never dies when others give it life again. And so we have this huge responsibility to give these people's dreams life again. And I would ask you, finally, please, just to join me, if you can, if you want to, to stand for a moment of silence in memory of all those I mentioned and all those I couldn't. Thank you.